Chapter 9 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 9 England under William the Second, called Rufus. William the Red, in breathless haste, secured the three great forts of Dover, Pevensey, and Hastings, and made with hot speed for Winchester, where the royal treasure was kept. The treasurer delivering him the keys, he found that it amounted to sixty thousand pounds in silver, besides gold and jewels. Possessed of this wealth, he soon persuaded the Archbishop of Canterbury to crown him, and became William the Second, King of England. Rufus was no sooner on the throne then he ordered into prison again the unhappy state captives whom his father had set free, and directed a goldsmith to ornament his father's tomb profusely with gold and silver. It would have been more dutiful in him to have attended the sick conqueror when he was dying, but England itself, like this red king who once governed it, has sometimes made expensive tombs for dead men whom it treated shabbily when they were alive. The king's brother, Robert of Normandy, seemed quite content to be only duke of that country, and the king's other brother, fine scholar, being quiet enough with his five thousand pounds in a chest, the king flattered himself, we may suppose, with the hope of an easy reign. But easy reigns were difficult to have in those days. The turbulent Bishop Odo, who had blessed the Norman army at the Battle of Hastings, and who I dare say took all the credit of the victory to himself, soon began, in concert with some powerful Norman nobles, to trouble the Red King. The truth seems to be that this bishop and his friends, who had land in England and lands in Normandy, wished to hold both under one sovereign, and greatly preferred a thoughtless, good-natured person such as Robert was, to Rufus, who, though being far from an amiable man in any respect, was keen and not to be imposed upon. They declared in Robert's favour, and retired to their castles, those castles were very troublesome to kings, in a sullen humour. The Red King, seeing the Normans thus falling from him, revenged himself upon them by appealing to the English, to whom he made a variety of promises, which he never meant to perform, in particular promises to soften the cruelty of the forest laws, and who in return so aided him with their valour, that Odo was besieged in the castle of Rochester, and forced to abandon it, and to depart from England for ever, whereupon the other rebellious Norman nobles were soon reduced and scattered. Then the Red King went over to Normandy, where the people suffered greatly under the loose rule of Duke Robert. The King's object was to seize upon the Duke's dominions. This the Duke, of course, prepared to resist, and miserable war between the two brothers seemed inevitable, when the powerful nobles on both sides, who had seen so much of war, interfered to prevent it. A treaty was made. Each of the two brothers agreed to give up something of his claims, and that the longer liver of the two should inherit all the dominions of the other. When they had come to this loving understanding, they embraced and joined their forces against Fine Scholar, who had bought some territory of Robert with a part of his five thousand pounds, and was considered a dangerous individual in consequence. St. Michael's Mount in Normandy, there is another St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall, wonderfully like it, was then, as it is now, a strong place perched upon the top of a high rock, around which, when the tide is in, the sea flows leaving no road to the mainland. In this place, Fine Scholar shut himself up with his soldiers, and here he was closely besieged by his two brothers. At one time, when he was reduced to great distress for want of water, the generous Robert not only permitted his men to get water, but sent Fine Scholar wine from his own table, and, on being remonstrated with by the Red King, said, What, shall we let our own brother die of thirst? Where shall we get another when he is gone? At another time, the Red King, riding alone on the shore of the bay, looking up at the castle, was taken by two of Fine Scholar's men, one of whom was about to kill him, when he cried out, Hold, knave, I am the King of England! The story says that the soldier raised him from the ground respectfully and humbly, and that the King took him into his service. The story may or may not be true, but at any rate it is true that Fine Scholar could not hold out against his united brothers, and that he abandoned Mount St. Michael, and wandered about as poor and forlorn as other scholars have been sometimes known to be. The Scotch became unquiet in the Red King's time, and were twice defeated, the second time with the loss of their king Malcolm and his son. The Welsh became unquiet too, 
Against them, Rufus was less successful, for they fought among their native mountains, and did great execution on the king's troops. Robert of Normandy became unquiet too, and complaining that his brother the king did not faithfully perform his part of their agreement, took up arms, and obtained assistance from the king of France, whom Rufus, in the end, bought off with vast sums of money. England became unquiet too. Lord Mowbray, the powerful Earl of Northumberland, headed a great conspiracy to depose the king, and to place upon the throne Stephen, the conqueror's near relative. The plot was discovered. All the chief conspirators were seized. Some were fined, some were put in prison, and some were put to death. The Earl of Northumberland himself was shut up in a dungeon beneath Windsor Castle, where he died an old man, thirty long years afterwards. The priests in England were more unquiet than any other class or power, for the Red King treated them with such small ceremony that he refused to appoint new bishops or archbishops when the old ones died, but kept all the wealth belonging to those offices in his own hands. In return for this, the priests wrote his life when he was dead, and abused him well. I am inclined to think, myself, that there was little to choose between the priests and the Red King, that both sides were greedy and designing, and that they were fairly matched. The Red King was false of heart, selfish, covetous, and mean. He had a worthy minister in his favorite, Ralph, nicknamed, for almost every famous person had a nickname in those rough days, Flambard, or the Firebrand. Once, the king being ill, became penitent, and made Anselm, a foreign priest and a good man, Archbishop of Canterbury. But he no sooner got well again than he repented of his repentance and persisted in wrongfully keeping to himself some of the wealth belonging to the archbishopric. This led to violent disputes, which were aggravated by there being in Rome at that time two rival popes, each of whom declared he was the only real, original, infallible pope, who couldn't make a mistake. At last, Anselm, knowing the Red King's character, and not feeling himself safe in England, asked leave to return abroad. The Red King gladly gave it, for he knew that as soon as Anselm was gone, he could begin to store up all the Canterbury money again, for his own use. By such means, and by taxing and oppressing the English people in every possible way, the Red King became very rich. When he wanted money for any purpose, he raised it by some means or other, and cared nothing for the injustice he did, or the misery he caused. Having the opportunity of buying from Robert the whole Duchy of Normandy for five years, he taxed the English people more than ever, and made the very convents sell their plate and valuables to supply him with the means to make the purchase. But he was as quick and eager in putting down revolt as he was in raising money, for a part of the Norman people objecting, very naturally, I think, to being sold in this way, he headed an army against them with all the speed and energy of his father. He was so impatient that he embarked for Normandy in a great gale of wind, and when the sailors told him it was dangerous to go to sea in such angry weather, he replied, Hoist and sail away! Did you ever hear of a king who was drowned? You will wonder how it was that even the careless Robert came to sell his dominions. It happened thus. It had long been the custom for many English people to make journeys to Jerusalem, which were called pilgrimages, in order that they might pray beside the tomb of our Saviour there. Jerusalem belonging to the Turks, and the Turks hating Christianity, these Christian travellers were often insulted and ill-used. The pilgrims bore it patiently for some time, but at length a remarkable man of great earnestness and eloquence, called Peter the Hermit, began to preach in various places against the Turks, and to declare that it was the duty of good Christians to drive away those unbelievers from the tomb of our Saviour, and to take possession of it and protect it. An excitement such as the world had never known before was created. Thousands and thousands of men of all ranks and conditions departed for Jerusalem to make war against the Turks. This war is called in history the First Crusade, and every crusader wore a cross marked on his right shoulder. All the crusaders were not zealous Christians. Among them were vast numbers of the restless, idle, profligate, and adventurous spirit of the time. Some became crusaders for the love of change, some in hope of plunder, some because they had nothing to do at home, some because they did what the priests told them, some because they liked to see foreign countries, some because they were fond of knocking men about, and would as soon knock a Turk about as a Christian. Robert of Normandy may have been influenced by all these motives, and by a kind desire, besides, to save the Christian pilgrims from bad treatment in the future. He wanted to raise a number of armed men, 
and to go to the crusade. He could not do so without money. He had no money, and he sold his dominions to his brother, the Red King, for five years. With the large sum he thus obtained, he fitted out his crusaders gallantly, and went away to Jerusalem in martial state. The Red King, who made money out of everything, stayed at home, busily squeezing more money out of Normans and English. After three years of great hardship and suffering, from shipwreck at sea, from travel in strange lands, from hunger, thirst, and fever upon the burning sands of the desert, and from the fury of the Turks, the valiant crusaders got possession of our Saviour's tomb. The Turks were still resisting and fighting bravely, but this success increased the general desire in Europe to join the crusade. Another great French duke was proposing to sell his dominions for a term to the rich Red King, when the Red King's reign came to a sudden and violent end. You have not forgotten the new forest which the conqueror made, and which the miserable people whose homes he laid waste so hated. The cruelty of the forest laws, and the torture and death they brought upon the peasantry, increased this hatred. The poor persecuted country people believed that the new forest was enchanted. They said that in thunderstorms and on dark nights demons appeared, moving beneath the branches of the gloomy trees. They said that a terrible spectre had foretold to Norman hunters that the Red King should be punished there. And now, in the pleasant season of May, when the Red King had reigned almost thirteen years, and a second prince of the conqueror's blood, another Richard, the son of Duke Robert, was killed by an arrow in this dreaded forest, the people said that the second time was not the last, and that there was another death to come. It was a lonely forest, accursed in the people's hearts for the wicked deeds that had been done to make it and no man save the king and his courtiers and huntsmen liked to stray there. But in reality it was like any other forest. In the spring the green leaves broke out of the buds. In the summer flourished hardily, and made deep shades. In the winter shriveled and blew down, and lay in brown heaps on the moss. Some trees were stately and grew high and strong. Some had fallen of themselves. Some were felled by the forester's axe. Some were hollow, and the rabbits burrowed at their roots. Some few were struck by lightning and stood white and bare. There were hillsides covered with rich fern, on which the morning dew so beautifully sparkled. There were brooks where the deer went down to drink, or over which the whole herd bounded, flying from the arrows of the huntsmen. There were sunny glades and solemn places where but little light came through the rustling leaves. The songs of the birds in the new forest were pleasanter to hear than the shouts of fighting men outside and even when the Red King and his court came hunting through its solitudes, cursing loud and riding hard, with a jingling of stirrups and bridles and knives and daggers, they did much less harm there than among the English or Normans, and the stags died, as they lived, far easier than the people. Upon a day in August, the Red King, now reconciled to his brother, Fine Scholar, came with a great train to hunt in the new forest. Fine Scholar was of the party. They were a merry party, and had lain all night at Melwood Keep, a hunting lodge in the forest, where they had made good cheer both at supper and breakfast, and had drunk a deal of wine. The party dispersed in various directions, as the custom of the hunters then was. The king took with him only Sir Walter Tyrrell, who was a famous sportsman, and to whom he had given, before they mounted horse that morning, two fine arrows. The last time the king was ever seen alive, he was riding with Sir Walter Tyrrell, and their dogs were hunting together. It was almost night when a poor charcoal burner, passing through the forest with his cart, came upon the solitary body of a dead man, shot with an arrow in the breast, and still bleeding. He got it into his cart. It was the body of the king, shaken and tumbled with its red beard, all whitened with lime and clotted with blood. It was driven in the cart by the charcoal burner next day to Winchester Cathedral, where it was received and buried. Sir Walter Tyrrell, who escaped to Normandy, and claimed the protection of the King of France, swore in France that the Red King was suddenly shot dead by an arrow from an unseen hand while they were hunting together, that he was fearful of being suspected as the King's murderer, and that he instantly set spurs to horse and fled to the seashore. Others declared that the King and Sir Walter Tyrrell were hunting in company, a little before sunset, standing in bushes opposite one another when a stag came between them, that the King drew his bow and took aim but the string broke, that the king then cried, Shoot, Walter, in the devil's name, that Sir Walter shot, that the arrow glanced against a tree, was turned aside from the stag, 
and struck the king from his horse dead. By whose hand the red king really fell, and whether that hand dispatched the arrow to his breast by accident or by design, is only known to God. Some think his brother may have caused him to be killed, but the red king had made so many enemies both among priests and people that suspicion may reasonably rest upon a less unnatural murderer. Men know no more than that he was found dead in the new forest, which the suffering people had regarded as a doomed ground for his race. End of chapter 9